It is block height, 482,647. This is Block Digest, episode 11. And today I'm joined by a very special guest. He's rumored to have been one of the first 10 people to even hear about Bitcoin and even sacrificed his freedom for the project, making him a very tough act to follow. It is Charlie Schrem. Hello. Thanks for having me. Uh, how, are you? how are you? Fantastic. Good, good. And I've also got Shinobi. Hello, everybody. What's going on? And Mr. Hoddle. How you doing, guys? Great, great. Good, good. So, Charlie, how's life? Life is good. I got with some Bitcoiner last night and uh, was in town. And uh, it's a beautiful Wednesday here in Florida. Yeah, fantastic. How are you liking those all-time highs, eh? It's about to hit another one. Yeah. And who would have thought that would have happened? Like with all this stuff with the hard forking going on, I think if you told somebody this like a year ago, they would have said, this is ridiculous. This is never going to happen. It's just going to cause another bear trend. I think that it's a, it's a non-event. And I think that the whole Bcash thing really taught people that it's, it's just a lot of FUD. And um, Jihan and a lot of these other Bitmain you know, crew are purposely trying to keep the price as low as possible so they can accumulate as much Bitcoin as they can because they know as soon as they take the lid off, the price is going to sh shoot to the roof. There's Everyone wants to own some Bitcoin and there aren't even enough Bitcoin that will ever exist that every millionaire in China can have just one. And that's just in China. So think about the rest of the world. So they're going to keep doing FUD like you say when the whole patent thing today and the whole SegWit 2X thing is more FUD and it's just all more FUD that's being created by people to artificially keep the price low. But if you just sit back and hold and relax, you're going to always make money. So you're saying that the price would be even higher were it not for the FUD? For, were it not for all the FUD, the price would be m double. And let, let's start there then. So what happened when, once you, you helped out with the New York agreement? Is that right? Sure. You okay, could arguably say that everyone was involved in the New York agreement. Um, uh, miners, businesses, all the core devs were there. Like everyone was, was physically there. At the end of the day, the idea was, all right, we get everyone in a room and everyone agree to a hard fork and a, like a scaling plan to activate SegWit. So all the miners said, yeah, we'll activate SegWit. The business says, we'll activate SegWit. And then we asked core, like, can you guys agree to a hard fork for two megabytes? Yes. Can you agree to a hard fork for two megabytes within three months? No. And the miners said, well, then we won't activate SegWit until you agree to some specific day. And core developers, some of them didn't want to agree to a specific day. And some of them didn't want to agree to a specific anything at all because core is not really an entity that can agree to anything, which is a good idea. So the agreement wasn't supposed to, to be something where it would be like it would be like an enforceable document with an alternative client. The, the agreement was just like a statement. These companies, these miners, this is what we want. And hopefully Core would agree to it and, and, and develop something out of it. Maybe they develop their own plan and they run everything as they've been doing for the past eight years. It wasn't supposed, as, I, as far as I know, because and, and a lot of people, it wasn't supposed to be this alternative client, BTC1, and this whole alternative, like all these, just Jeff Garzik developing and stuff like that. That's not what it was supposed to be, but I guess it's what it is now. And all the miners and businesses that I spoke to are still sticking by it and following through. They see it as a non-event. What will happen is in November, they'll just, all the miners will start accepting bigger blocks and that'll be that no change really except why, for that why didn't the exchanges sign it i mean why didn't bitstamp and, and so on well exchanges exchanges are going to just exchanges are trying to be neutral they can't be seen to take positions but coinbase is going to be labeling that one as bitcoin and all spv clients by default follow the longest chains and the longest chain will be the segment 2x chain assuming all the miners follow it as, as they sign on to it and then all the exchanges legally, like Gemini, legally has to follow the longest chain. So it's not whether they sign it or not. And there could be a whole branding war over what is Bitcoin or not. But at the end of the day, it's going to be the longest chain with the most hashing power will be what they have to call Bitcoin. Right. Uh, well, you, it's, it's, 
Shinobi, do you want to um, go into it and I'll do the visual? Yeah. Um, it's, it's a little more complicated than just SPV wallets will blindly follow things, uh, Charlie, because essentially what they do is just check the header for the block and then the Merkle proof for the transactions they're querying. And they really do absolutely no check whatsoever as far as like the block itself or, or a chain that it's on. So it, it could get really screwy. Like you, you could have a wallet connected to the legacy chain and accepting those and then randomly make a connection to a 2X chain. And then if that's longer, it'll reorg. And if it sure. loses that connection and goes to core and core is longer, it would reorg back to that. And it How could would even core become longer though? But, but the point is, though, it could even simultaneously be connected to both. And then depending on how the logic of the wallet is set up, like that can get screwy. And it, there's just a, a lot of fringe cases that it make it really not as black and white as it'll just follow 2x. Okay. So in other words, it's, I, not, it's not as simple as just following the longest. Sure, chain. sure. Yeah. I don't think anyone argues that, that I, and, I'm not a developer, so I'm simplifying it. But I'll leave it up to those who are to make sure it's it's, it's working. No, Para's uh, blog post uh, claims that there are only around, I mean, there must be more than this, but 183 BTC1 nodes right now. And there are 6,116 uh, sure. Bitcoin core nodes. Sure. So when the SPV wallet connects to get the UTXO set for that wallet, and you know, you and I know that it's not it's not the amount of nodes that matters. I can literally go during the show right now on AWS and spin up 10,000 nodes. Like that's, it's yeah, who yeah. are the nodes. It's more mm -hmm. important than how many nodes. Sure, but those those SPV wallets, we don't know which nodes they're going to connect to. So then it's just sure. a case of statistical well, like probability. I just I just wanted to say something. Um, when you have a hundred over a hundred thousand nodes, non listening nodes, that have been basically on the network for the last two and a half years, you're going to have SPV wallets connecting to those nodes. I mean, there's way over 100,000. It's not 9,000. You have about 9,000 listening nodes, but we don't even know how many are, are, are on the Onion only. You have no idea how many nodes sure. are out there. So you're going to need... We want to get into specifics about how all these nodes and which ones are connecting. You should really have a developer come in and, and talk to you about that because I'm not qualified to answer these questions. Yeah, yeah I know. think we're kind of like uh, going off into the weeds a little bit from the whole 2x thing at this point. Well, I, I, I was I've made my, some... my position really clear that like where it is now is not what a lot of us originally intended it to be. So kind of what happens in the next few weeks, um, a lot of, you know, we're going to, over the next few weeks, we're going to see really how this plays out. Um, I had a lot of conversations with a few different people that are actively on working on SegWit 2X and non, and, and we really want to see like, you know, SegWit adoption, like how quickly it happens and um, what the fees are like and, and how things kind of progress and play out. And uh, do we really need still a two megabyte hard fork? Who's really, but there's a lot of like, what ifs right now. So we're just kind of everyone's taking like a deep a breather. Um, I'm getting married in two weeks. So I'm really not involved in any of this right now. And then I'm going to be on my honeymoon. So I'm going to be off like internet till like November. Congrats. So, you're, you're one of the lucky you. ones. Yeah. You'll, yeah. Be, you'll be back just in time for the drama when it, when it all kicks off. Well, not I don't care. Really. I mean, <laughs> at least Charlie has an excuse. Barry has no excuse to be missing in action right now. He's, he's fishing, I think. Oh, okay. Fishing. Nice. But he, like I spoke to him the other day. He, it's like, there's like crazy character assassinations that just come out and they like attack you. And it's like, I don't blame him for not wanting to be on Twitter. And he, he had never really that much involvement. All he did was he's like a business guy. He'll, he'll get on the phone and get people on the phone and, and answering emails and, and stuff like that. But it's really Jeff who's, who's running right now. But I spoke to Jeff and I said, Jeff, like you can't be the only developer kind of doing this going forward. And that's what they're trying to figure out, like who will be involved in this. Because the, char the, char the charter was simple. The charter wasn't to, the idea wasn't to have a, an alternative long-term client and now all of a sudden developing for Bitcoin. There's no fire core here. 99.9% .9 of the people. In fact, I had a whole, like I had a whole fight with the CTO of Bitcoin.com and I almost kicked him out. I said, 
he was on the Segwit 2X Slack. He's like, yeah, we need to fire Corey. I said, F you, man. Like, get the hell out of here. Go mine Bcash. Like, there's there's none of that. We, we, there's none of that fire core. We're all inclusive here. That's what we do. So if you want to go and you want to use this as, like, some sort of chess move for your own bullshit, then you can go go the hell out of here and go mine Bcash. We don't want you mining Bitcoin. Get the hell out of here. Like, you're fire you, I told him. I said, you can leave. Take your all bullshit hash power and just go. We don't want you. Stop threatening us. Stop using this as, as some rook in your chess game. If you want to threaten to, oh, we're going to go mine Bcash or Segway 2X doesn't happen, get the fuck out of here now. Have a nice day. I don't want to deal with you. Well, yeah, in which case he just needs to, to mine Bcash. And he didn't. And he's still mining Bitcoin, of course, because it's bullshit. Because <laughs> it's more profitable. Yeah. Go leave. Have a, you can go. Yeah. Go. But the, we had Olivier on here a couple of weeks ago when we just first started, and he was talking about the that there's no need for replay protection. And I can give firsthand information on, you know, why exchanges want replay protection. It's because, and, and I'm sort of quoting here really uh, from, from internally at, inside of an exchange is that exchanges kind of felt like they were being given this power to decide, you know, which chain would be the chain and what the ticker symbol would be. Mm -hmm. And that's not a power that they want. No. Right. They don't. They, that's not a power they want to exercise or they feel even comfortable using. So the reason to be neutral, I mean, we, we've been called things like cowards for not picking a team, but only when it's your team. Right. If I'm getting the yeah, question from a UASF, and, and personally, I was running a UASF note, but I have to maintain some distance here when I'm representing a business and when I'm, you know, formulating these decisions. But of course, he means like because I'm not picking your team, but you're asking me to pick a team. And that's the reason why replay protection would be so worthwhile. Sure. You know, from, but, from but by saying that replay protection needs to be added to the Segwit 2X chain, you're picking a side in that situation. You should be advocating both add replay protection in there. Oh, sure, sure. I yeah, mean, absolutely. I mean, I mean, like, I can see where you're coming from there, Charlie, but that's just logistically impossible. That's essentially what? expecting core to be able to logistically pull off a hard fork, which is why we're in this situation in the first place. Like everybody would have to no, willingly upgrade. No, hard forks are enough. easy. We're in the situation because it's a it's a political battle. Well, I, I know, mean, in the sense that hard forks are not hard. Yeah, you don't need to read into the fud there. Like, come on, hard, hard forks are not difficult to do. It's the most talented people in the world working on this. Like, that's not a scary thing anymore. Well, the, well the, I, I don't do mean it. like a hard they fork soft, as in like they can something. Fork. I mean like like everybody would there have are ways to, to get replay protection. Sure, sure. There are ways to add in replay protection and for them too. I mean, we'll no, see what happens. Charlie, I mean, Charlie. In order, no, I think there's a, a confusion with hard forks, man. I think you think the developers have a way to make me run software that I don't want to run. They can't. You're gonna no, have another. That. Well, in a hard fork, in order to have a successful hard fork, you need everybody to agree. To upgrade. I know. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying there are ways to add replay protection in there. But they would have to hard fork in order to fork. do that. I don't think that's there's, possible. Yeah, there's some been some – go check out the GitHubs because there are some some work that people are doing that enable that to happen. Okay, that's news to me. I'm going to have to read on that. Okay, cool. Do you want to go grab well, I mean, from what I've seen, like the, the only replay protection proposed for um, 2X so far is the opt-in, opt-return replay protection. And that would actually require wallets on our side, the, the original chain, to modify how they craft transactions. So it would actually be our software that would have to be changed we can, in order for we that can, to work. We can sit here and debate which chain should have replay but that, it's not a debate we'll, we'll, it, it is debate, well though. it is if, if if one person is saying one thing and someone else is saying another thing it's a debate by definition but the question is obviously you guys know that whichever chain agrees to add replay protection is admitting that they are not bitcoin brand anymore so it's like admitting defeat in a way like that's that's pretty much how what what it plays down to um so, I mean, that's just clearing up the FUD in that situation. Is there anything wrong with that, though? Like, admitting that it's not... No, of course. I mean, this is like a fundamental question of, like, what is Bitcoin? And there are a lot of different opinions on it. Um, I don't know the answer. and I, I won't even try to figure it out. But there are a lot of, like, people that are saying, like, there's more hashing power. There's people that will say the community consensus, which is what 
a lot of people use, but like, what is community consensus? You know, like, okay, Twitter, Reddit, all the users, but where you know, 90% of Bitcoin users aren't on Twitter or Reddit or, or anywhere like that. They're just people holding their funds in, in wallets and using it or exchanges or whatever. It's like, what is, can, how do you measure community consensus is it's, it's your person. And I asked Luke that, and he said, he said to me the other day in person, he said, it's my personal feeling. My personal feeling is what community consensus is. That's what he well, said. I mean, like, that's what it comes down to. There, there, we don't have many quantifiable metrics to tell us what consensus is, as far as I know. And again, I'm not a developer, so. I, well, it's not, I can't. it's not, it's not, a, that's because it's not a technical problem. It's a political yeah. and philosophical problem. And uh, my definition of consensus is where nobody disagrees, even in the presence of misunderstanding. Right? Sure. People can misunderstand about what the nature of the reality is, but they'll still be wrong, even in the presence of that misunderstanding. So and, if it was up to me, if yeah. it was up to me, I would put Bitcoin as the 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 developer and business and miner community all together, whatever they agree on as a, as a whole. And, and and so the business and miners is one thing, but the developer community around Bitcoin, it's a big deal. It's a pretty robust community, and it's one of the best. I think like we have the most talented developers, and I don't. I don't, this is my issue with the whole Segwit 2X thing. And I've been public about this is that we're going from an amazing, you know, whether you don't like some of the physical personalities of some of the people, that's fine. Cause we're all socially awkward. I'm on the spectrum with, you know, we're all a bunch of weirdos geeks and we have, we have social and communication issues, but taking that aside, the actual development and people that are working on Bitcoin on a day to day are amazing. And I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to like, this is my issue. I don't want to like replace that with Jeff Garzik, like just one person, because that's what it is right now. And I told him that. And so they're working on whatever the solution is, hopefully. But like, that's my, that's my issue right now. People say like, you know, where do you stand on this? Like I signed an agreement and I'm going to stick by it for now. But my issue with this right now is like, what are we doing? We have this amazing developer community and we have been working on Bitcoin for the past eight years and now we're all of a sudden going to replace them. That wasn't what I signed on for. That wasn't the idea here. So, you know, where do we go from here? What role do you think social media has played in this? Do you think that it's actually hurt more than it's helped? I think it's, it's been a good and a bad thing because censorship is bullshit. Like, whether you, you know, like Roger Cry censorship and then Core Cry censorship, and it's all, it's, it's stupid. Anyone with a brain can weed through the FUD if they actually try. If you want to blindly listen to like what someone reads, what someone says on the internet and stuff, and you don't have the ability to get a few different opinions, then that's on you. But social media is important. We should move all social media to a blockchain though, so then this way it can't be edited as people want it to be. We need to make social media immutable. Well, if you make not it like Ethereum, Ethereum, then you have, then you well, have open timestamps. Uh, we've yeah, got the open go. timestamp bot from Peter Todd. You can cement any tweet you find in the Bitcoin blockchain for all time. I like this that. Was, open yeah, timestamp so is cool. Eternity, Eternity Wall that has done like a visual uh, wrapper for that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's well, a big deal. Yeah. But then, of course, you're going to get the FUD is going to be immutable as well. You're still going to need filters. What I mean is. Well, you'll be. Yeah, true. But I feel like you'll be able to call people out on their stuff. Like. Right. All these people like posted all these, you know, Bitcoin is at 4,300. Everyone's posting double top charts. Pr prices are, you know, double. I screenshotted all of these. And then, of course, price breaks out and they all delete. <laughs> yeah. People delete that. Listen, if I'm wrong, I don't delete my tweets. Like, you can go check. And, and I just, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. Call me out. Call, you know, whatever. Okay. So, Shinobi, what did you want to move on to? So, we're about five, 10 minutes. Well, uh, like, I, I just want to say, like, you know, I, this, this isn't meant to be, like, attacking in any way, Charlie, sure. but it, it kind of seems to me like you, you have, like, a history of kind of changing your mind to fit whatever the community sentiment is. And, like, I, I've never really seen you take, like, a, a black and white, like, this is what I believe stand. Sure. So, like, it, just ignoring, like, the community sentiment, like, what direction do you want to see Bitcoin go in personally dealing with some sure. of these scaling issues? 
No, of course. Um, I understand that. Is it possible for you to provide other examples of me being wishy-washy? Because I, I don't really know of any. I mean, it's, it's uh, saying that I have a history of doing that. Do you have like three or four different examples of me doing that? I mean, just like the, the, the ICO um, after you recently got out of jail. And then it seems like to tear credit that wish, again. Wishy-washy is but, that I tried to launch a company. I realized it was a bad idea, so I stopped doing it. Well, I, I mean, like, I, I, I might have framed the question a, a little. Yeah, if you want to rephrase that question, because that's, that, I mean, I'm not going to personally take offense to that, but people would. So. Just, like, ignoring, like, trying to keep the peace or, like, find the middle ground. Like, just where where do you, if all of that was not an issue, want to see Bitcoin go as far as, like, how to handle the scaling issue? Sure. I want to see SegWit have adoption. And the idea for the two megabyte hard fork was to ease congestion while we give that a chance to happen. And most people agreed that that was okay. Um, a small increase wasn't a big deal. If, if the core developers had proposed it, then we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We would follow them, no problem. But the fact that it wasn't proposed by them and was proposed by other people, that's what we come down to. That's what we're having this argument at the end of the day. So I'm still standing by an agreement that I signed. I'm not being wishy-washy here, but that doesn't, that doesn't um, say that I can't come on your show and say what, how I feel and what problems I have with something. I'm not going to just, fl- I, I don't blindly follow sheep. And again, your community sentiment can be different than what other community sentiment I'm hearing too. Um, you know, Slack channels and telegram rooms and stuff like that tend to be echo chambers. So I try to go in all of them and hear what everyone has to say. I physically meet with people and talk to them. I physically had dinner with Luke Deshier last week. I physically had a drink with a guy who's one of the biggest Bitcoin investors I know last night. And I talk to them and I try to understand like, what are you, you guys are, these good people are financially invested in the technology and these businesses. Like, what do you guys want? What are you guys saying? Not just people. If, if someone can be symbol attacked, then I don't really, I don't really uh, look at that as the community personally, because anyone can spin up thousands of Slack accounts and say whatever they want to say. Well, you, you've That's taken hard on to this, do. You've taken on this huge responsibility by doing this, by going to all these people. We already discussed how difficult it was to measure consensus. And so I guess that puts you in the firing line, right? Because if you want to Sure. Play... I'm getting character assassinated. I got people telling me that I'm being wishy-washy. I got people telling me, yes, I'm trying to keep the peace. I'll be honest with you. The Bitcoin is my baby. Like, you know, like I maybe I was just like back in the day, it was so small. And this was like, it's my legacy. If Bitcoin dies or goes away, then what am I going to do in the future? Yeah, that's um, a good point. So, you feel so like I'm going to do, do whatever I can to, to ensure its future success. And I hate to see all these people fighting. Yeah, it sucks that Roger's attacking me on Twitter every day. I don't know why he went all crazy. I have a picture of his daughter on my fridge, you know? Like, yeah. it's just like, he's family to me. You know, I'm public, he's attacking me. It's stupid. Okay. I think there's a lot of that going around right now. It, it's so, it's really like, like the stupidest thing in the world that's going on right now. Everyone attacking each other and being all immature and pretending that we're not all brothers and family. And we all have one common goal. You know, and it's just, it is what it is. How do we coalesce? I'm taking a break from it right now. I'm getting married. I'm going on my honeymoon. I'm taking a break from all this. I don't, I don't blame you. But how do we co- coalesce around that, that theme of like focusing on one goal? I don't know. But if you could give us the answer, it'd be such a great wrap up. I know. I don't <laughs> I mean, I think it just starts with having these conversations. Like, I think all of us have very yeah. different opinions on things here, but we're sitting down and having a civil discussion. The best thing that could happen right now, to be honest, and you you work at Bitfinex, so you you could you could push this really. We need to say, if we can get a lo- like SegWit adoption really ramping up quickly, we can make the case that maybe to the miners that maybe there's no need for a hard fork at this point, if ever, because. Right now, we're looking at like 1%, 1 to 2% SegWit transactions per block. If we can get that to 10, 20%, if we can get all of exchanges using SegWit as their uh, for all withdrawals, like we can save a lot of block. We can see 1.2, 1.3 megabyte blocks within the next few weeks. If, we can, if that could happen, that would be amazing. 
because that'll free up a lot of block space. And that's what I'm really trying to do every day. I'm making phone calls. I know the Trezor is supporting it. I know that Bitco is ramping up, and a lot of wallets use Bitco. A lot of exchanges use Bitco as their back end. Um, um, I'm trying to get on – Ledger's we're doing it now. Uh, I'm waiting for the uh, blockchain.info. I'm waiting for the exchanges to, to implement it. We could do that. That'll free up a lot of – I know a lot of the gambling sites that, are, that use Bitcoin are doing it, working on it. It just takes a little bit, but if we can get that going – That'll free up a lot of block space. And then maybe we don't even need to have a, a hard fork. Wow. That sounds like a, a very uh, good goal for me to go ahead and, and work yeah. on. It sounds like you're working extremely hard as well. Like in the background, you're naming all these still companies. Call up Phil. Emailing. Yeah, I, I will. You, we should get him on here with you and you guys should. Yeah, uh, we should. Yeah. I enjoyed Let's that chat that. that you guys had on Whale that time. But listen, Charlie, thanks so much for your time, man. I really appreciate Phil, it. Phil was the original OG. Phil and I were doing Bitcoin yeah. OTC trades before OTC even existed, before Bitfinex was even like a thing. He's like, Phil's, Phil's like real OG. Yeah, cool. Well, I'll ask him. And uh, look, I really appreciate you coming on and no taking problem. the time out. Thanks, guys. And yeah, thank you very much, Charlie. Thank you guys for yeah, doing what you. you're doing. Thank you guys for yeah. doing Keep doing this. This is important. Feel free to have me on whenever you want or message me in the Slack and I'll try to always give you an honest answer. Yeah, we appreciate uh, that. To your, to your credit, Charlie, that's that's the one thing I like about you. You always seem to be honest. I try. I'll cool. talk to you guys Good. later. Bye. All right. Thanks a lot. Take it easy. What's, what's the afterglow? I think we should do the afterglow on air. So many of you may not know this, but like usually after we go off air, we jump back in the mumble and we have something called an afterglow. So tell me how you think that went, guys. I think it, I think it went pretty well. Like he, you know, he's kind of showing that that as from his point of view, at least as a participant in this agreement, he really does seem to have genuine desire to just help. Like that, this wasn't at least an intent, a, a takeover or something intentionally trying or trying to disrupt things. They were trying to craft an agreement so that we could all move on together. And I mean. I still vehemently oppose this agreement, but I find it very hard to be personally angry at most of the people involved in it. Yeah, I find him sincere in his intentions, even if I don't necessarily agree with the, the outcomes to his decisions that he's made. But that's easy for me to say because I'm not the one in his position. Like I found it kind of moving, actually, when he talked about his legacy and Bitcoin and how him and Roger go back such a long way. And I think a lot of people are feeling like that. I mean, I certainly, you know, was involved in the project for a long time ago and had a close friend. And then, you know, there was this kind of rift and, and I'm still, you know, losing sleep over this and wondering like how, what happened, like what, what's going on and, and why was there this kind of um, such a divergence in thinking and how did that happen and how could it have been prevented? And I, I think that's something that the internet does to us is it kind of puts us in the same mood together. We kind of resonate because we're connected to each other. Even these people that are a long way away from us, you know, thousands and thousands of miles can still put us in, in a bad mood or a good mood or, or make us feel things. And yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. I think that it's making it, I think we have to reevaluate how we make decisions given the, the enormity of the community that we now have, given the space that we have between us, the time zones. I think what would really help is if we stopped trying to communicate 140 characters and we actually came together on, you know, some kind of voice uh, video chats and like have breakout groups. That would probably be one of the best ways, I think, to handle it. Yeah, but life hack pro tip real quick. On Twitter, you can use more than 140 characters. Reply to your own tweet and string together a coherent thread. Well, then that creates a tweet storm. But it, it also conveys the idea completely. Yeah, it does. I just think that if you have something complex to say, don't try to say it in a low entropy format. Like say it in, you know, in a message space that accommodates for that complexity. I find the same thing with Slack. I made the mistake of thinking that Slack was a place where one could be verbose, but you can't be verbose in Slack. People don't like it when you're on the other end and you see a big chunk of text like this, it, it, you instantly feel daunted by it. And it, it sort of, it's very governing in a way because you feel like you have to kind of sit there on a screen and read through it. And if it's already a heated discussion, or if you feel like the other 
person is maybe criticizing you in this wall of text, then reading it is all the more difficult. And actually, if you feel threatened, you're likely to just kind of skim through it, look for keywords, misunderstand it, reply to a misunderstanding, perpetuate that misunderstanding onto other people. And then you're all talking about something completely different. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the big downside. That's why I like, you know, voice chat communities like the, the mumble or like whale pool. You actually get all, all the vocal nuances. You can actually completely articulate yourself in a way where people can take it in as fast as you're giving it out. And that there's not that constant lag for somebody to digest your point and respond to it. It's yeah. just a much superior like, way to communicate. I just want to read out a point here that Alp made. Um, Charlie is susceptible to being too trusting, uh, but waking up when confronted is not being wishy-washy. Yeah, I, I agree, Alp. I mean, I think personally, Shinobi, I think that question could have been better phrased. Like, yeah, yeah, I phrased that kind of poorly. Right. Like, I think um, See, I, that I was don't... actually a, a question from Gibbous originally, and Gibbous kind of, you know, gave quite a long um, sort of structured thing and. And it was, you know, it included that kind of notion that, you know, he said he said something before because, you know, give us an on here to kind of ask that question directly. You know, we didn't really want to follow through. Uh, Hoddle? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I don't think he's wishy-washy. I personally don't think he fully understands how Bitcoin works. I think he just doesn't understand. And this isn't on him. This has been going on basically since Gavin, making people think that nodes don't matter. And people have to come to realization that Bitcoin is pretty much ungovernable. Like you can't, the only way you'll get a hard fork is if everybody upgrades or else you're gonna get a chain behind. And he just doesn't want to admit that or he maybe just doesn't understand or I don't know what the case is there, but it's, I think that there's a, this, there's a lot of misinformation that's happening out there and hard forking Bitcoin is one of them. And so this narrative has been going on now for almost two, three years. And I think that's where it all starts. I think people think that hard forking Bitcoin isn't a big deal, but it's the biggest deal. And it's the reason why we've never done it. At least we've never done it a planned hard fork. So, you know, I think that this whole, this whole illusion of making, of making people believe that everyone is going to agree is, is silly. I think it's silly. And I think you, you have to come to terms that it's at least right now, because there hasn't been enough research done on hard forks, but at least today we know that if you hard fork Bitcoin, you're going to get another chain. I mean, it's just, it, that's what's going to happen. Um, and I think he doesn't believe that's the case. So we'll see. I, I think the emphasis should really be on governing rather than the government of Bitcoin. I don't think you can govern Bitcoin in the sense of like it being final. But we sense. have I think you can you can change the way you communicate with people. You can But we that. every 10 minutes, Chris, every 10 minutes we come to consensus. That is government. When you bought Bitcoin, you've already you're it's basically like a social contract that you walk into. You know what the consensus rule is. When you change consensus rule, you're going to get another chain out of it. I mean, it's, it, there's, yeah. there's that's now, not, that's not the only aspect to this though. I mean, that's the, once the code is written and deployed, there's that aspect to the mining process. I've installed the software. I agree to the code therein, but then there's like, what goes into the next version? And well, if the next problem. version, if, if the next version isn't backwards compatible, it's another chain. That's the next, if you're going to hard fork Bitcoin, you're going to get another chain. I mean, it's just, there's a reason why we haven't done this. There's a reason why the developers are saying, yeah, we're all for hard, for hard forks when we, get, when we get consensus, when we do enough research behind it. Because today, you, you're not, you're just, not, it's not going to happen. I mean, even if you get 90% of the miners, you know, to another, like mining another chain, there's still going to be people out there that are going to be running these nodes and eventually the difficulty is going to drop and then eventually it's it, this chain is going to continue working. So, yeah, I mean, all that's why every upgrade that we've had to date has been backwards compatible. So if you don't agree to it, you don't have to run the software. But if you start hard forking, well, now you're you're changing consensus rule and you're it's an it's going to be another chain unless everyone goes with you, unless everyone co goes along. Yeah. Well, I think I think we should try to work hard at trying to minimize the, the, the drama and the noise around the debate. Like, I think that 
that would be a good first step in terms of like the governance that goes in between each version. Um, and I think we're going to see these forks like this is just going to be the new normal now, at least for a while, like 2018 could yeah. be a year of fork. Yep. And people are just going to keep on forking that chain and that's going to put a burden on all the exchanges to like, you know, give their customers, you know, the, you know, the tokens in their private keys and so forth. So that's, that'll have to be a topic for another time because uh, we have to move on with today's show. But thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget, you can like and subscribe, but only if you want to. Bye for now.